this is hard to say. The reason I've tried so hard my whole life is because I've been terrified my whole life that I'm not good enough, that I don't measure up, that I'm inadequate, that I'm a fuck up, that I'm just not the first person you're going to pick to be on your team. You remember that, right? It was boys usually on the playground picking for dodgeball or, or baseball, softball, whatever we were playing basketball, pick up basketball, and that feeling in your stomach when you would be the last one picked, or that relief if you weren't, or even elation if you were the first one picked, that feeling, I think that's the feeling I've been trying to talk about, and if you dread that feeling, if you dread not being picked, if you dread other people considering that you're not good enough, especially people that you've put in a place where their opinion matters somehow, maybe your girlfriend, or maybe your boss, or maybe your dad, and if you feel inadequate in their eyes, it, it can make you try really hard. And it's kind of sad when you see it because you see people all the time who try too hard. I pity them. I pity me when it's me. There's this safety score I told you about. And there's this other guy in meeting. We're always at the top of the safety score, like jockeying for first and second place on that. And it makes me wonder, are we the two guys that are the most terrified of not being good enough? And I know you see valedictorians in that position, or maybe captains of various things, industry. <laughs> Gatsby, the great Gatsby, tried too hard. He tried too hard to please Daisy. And you can see he was an overachiever. To me, an overachiever is somebody who does it for other people's approval instead of for their own satisfaction. Because there's no such thing as overachieving if you're doing what you like or underachieving. You have only yourself to please. But if you don't have only yourself to please, it's probably out of fear of how other people think about you. Not all of the pain inflicted on me during the last eight years has been because of the music department at Millersville University or the university itself. The pain has come in other ways too, in relationships, and life situations, like getting older and other, other circumstances, almost does seem like a plan is there to, to make sure that I don't just skate through. Because I'm sure I never dealt with all of my childhood issues. I just kind of glossed them over and in some cases hid from them. Never really took care of it. A lot of the feelings of inadequacy, I think, were always there, even though I had compensated, mostly by doing things that the men in my family didn't do, didn't know how to do. And so if I stayed away from their, their achievements, then I could safely overcompensate for my lack of self-worth and in the time before I moved here I was doing that pretty well I was just compensating and glossing over and then it was as though life decided that it was time to rip the scabs off and 
get down to the bottom of the problems. And if there's one central problem, it's that terror of not being good enough, no matter what you do. And a lot of very accomplished people, and not just accomplished, but attractive and gifted and talented and whatever else, have these horrible feelings of inadequacy. You hear the stories again and again. Often the people who seem to have the most are the least sure that they're worth anything. So compensating that way is, is not going to do the job. By having a 100% safety score, that's not going to do the job. Or having a good job, or a girlfriend who um, other people envy you for. Or even a girlfriend that always desires you, no matter what. All of that means nothing if you don't first believe in yourself. You get clear down to the bottom of yourself and you know that you're okay. You know that you're spectacular. And that nothing to do with adding up all the things that the world tells you makes you spectacular. But just knowing it anyway or even in spite of things the world might tell you, messages. Thinking about teenage girls, they get such awful messages from media and from society at large. To say anything that could help teenage girls, but teenagers and, and everybody else, moms, middle-aged moms, who have stopped believing in their own value. We all know people in all these categories. People who have lost their jobs, all kinds of um, difficult circumstances where it's difficult to believe that you are worth anything. If I say anything that could help anybody know that they're spectacular regardless of all those messages including the cabal in your head that tells you all kinds of things about how you aren't good enough if if your cabal is like mine then it'll be worth it it'll be totally worth it I don't know a lot of people who are just bulletproof who just know they're okay, no matter what. I would say such people, if I've ever met one, are rare. But what a great place. What, even if just I figure it out, or just you figure it out, it becomes a better place. And not just for us. All of the things I've said so far about shifting into neutral, about putting your emotions in a place where they can't really um, inflict suffering or, or even just distract you, if you can get your emotions shifted into neutral and then you can look at everything rationally, calmly, you will find I think that you can start to believe in yourself too. When you can, when you finally get to the place where you just totally can believe in yourself, you won't be afraid anymore. And then I don't know what can stop you. I just don't. So if you feel needy because you don't really believe in yourself, you don't really believe in your fantasticness, then you go along needing other people to supply you with what, I don't know, dopamine you need or, or just esteem. And I expected that in my first marriage, 
and when it wasn't forthcoming, I moved on. And in my second marriage, when it wasn't forthcoming, I moved on. It feels like it would be easier to just meet my own needs and not need a supply from anyone else. When two people are supplying each other, and I had a friend who told me that. She said that she and her husband were like two leaky ships and they bailed each other out. And I've been there. I don't have any judgment if it works, but I think it would be easier if both boats were not leaking and sailing along under their own power. And I think it's possible. I mean, that seems obvious, but then the question is, well, how do you do that? And I think the way to do that is to nurture yourself better than, than mostly we do. I can be happy doing what I'm doing, whatever it is, and not doing other things that I might think have to be in my life, but they don't. Baloo the bear, that's one way to think about it. But I also believe I can manifest wealth, abundance of any kind, without needing other people in a codependent supply chain. I think I can do that. I don't have to settle for the bare necessities. I can have anything without feeling as though I'm draining anyone else or as though they're supplying me, whether they're being drained or not. And that's the answer because it isn't enough just to say what the problem is. There has to be an answer and I think that goes along with the other things I've been figuring out. Taking good care of me, not allowing things to trigger inadequacy, feelings of inadequacy. Shifting any time that tries to happen into neutral. And then feeling great because neutral is great. I think drug addicts get used to the idea that they like to be itchy so that they can scratch the itch. And I think it's better to put salve on the itch so it doesn't feel itchy anymore. We spend a lot of time in, in this current culture, post-COVID, we spend a lot of time scratching. I think it would be better if we spent time soothing. The best thing I can do for myself is to give myself permission to enjoy things the way they are. It's okay. I can enjoy things when they improve, but they're a lot more likely to improve if they don't need to improve. If I'm not attached to the idea that they have to improve. I think I've been taught to always be dissatisfied or I've taught myself. And I don't want to be smug and self-satisfied, but maybe I do. Maybe if I am, I'll find that things improve rapidly, even if they don't need to, because they don't need to. That seems to be the backwards law. The backwards law is an idea that Alan Watts had if you're interested in that one, look it up. It's, it's great. 